Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about basically how to get started using machine learning for camera traps and then kind of diving into some of the challenges that machine learning for camera traps faces and some of the best practices um, for actually using this stuff in, in the real world that uh, we found through my research, through um, working with different ecological groups and hopefully kind of keep you from making some of the same mistakes that others have made in the, in the past. Um, so uh, just a brief introduction. Um, I'm a graduate student at uh, Caltech and there I work specifically in computer vision. Um, so my area of expertise is not ecology. I'm not an ecologist. Um, and basically all the ecology I know, I've learned from my amazing collaborators. So if I get something wrong on the ecology side, please give me the benefit of the doubt. And um, I'm super happy to be here and kind of like meet you guys in the middle and try to just extend some of the computer vision knowledge that I have. Um, I'm also a student researcher at Google AI um, and there I work with the Wildlife Insights AI team. Um, and in the past I've collaborated with Microsoft AI for Earth and I'm actually currently um, collaborating with WildMe uh, trying to figure out basically what are some of the trade-offs when using machine learning to do animal re-identification from camera trap data? And this picture up here of me looking very dramatic is actually, uh, was my first field season, which was this January in Kenya. Um, I went out and placed a network of camera traps and kind of got my hands dirty. And that was actually really informative for me as well. Um, so I'm sure everyone on this call knows what a camera trap is but there are these cameras that are placed out in the wild and they're static and they're used to monitor wildlife populations and behavior. Um, and they're really widely used. So I got these estimates from Eric Fedgrass from Conservation International and he guesses that there are thousands of organizations, tens of thousands of projects, millions of camera traps and hundreds of millions of images out there already. And that's only expanding as the sensors get um, sort of cheaper and easy to use. Oh. Um, so one of the things that was kind of an initial stopper to being able to actually do good machine learning research for camera trap data was just data siloing. Every camera trap group tends to have their own way that they are storing and labeling their data. And then they're also hosting the data locally. So they'll have it you know, on a hard drive or maybe on their own local servers. Um, Machine learning works better with lots of data. And uh, one of the things that's really great that's come out in the last couple of years is Jeff Kloon's group at the University of Wyoming started this data repository called Lila.Science. And if you go on Lila.Science, there are lots of camera trap data sets, millions of images. They're all open source, publicly available, and they're labeled. And so this is a really great resource if you don't actually have labeled data already. You can go and see if there's data that might be labeled with some of the species you're interested in or um, potentially from a region that is near where your subject area is and add that data to your training set. And kind of along those same lines, because we want computer vision researchers to be interested in studying how to make machine learning work for camera trap data, for the last three years, I've been hosting this iWildCam Tagle competition. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking a bit about this year's competition throughout the talk and some of the, the lessons we learned. But if you guys are interested next year, we'll be having another iWildCam competition. And it's a really great way to kind of get your hand in the game and just try out some of the different machine learning techniques. Um, but why do we need all of this effort? Uh, machine learning is actually, and computer vision are actually sort of starting to work. Um, I don't know if any of you have used iNaturalist, um, but it's amazing. Uh, the, the suggested species is actually getting pretty good. Um, but the big problem going from something like iNaturalist to camera trap data is that camera traps don't have a human photographer. So, you know, the human going out and taking photos for a naturalist, they're pointing the camera at the thing they care about, making sure it's focused, well lit, centered. A camera trap doesn't have that. And so the animal that you're actually trying to detect or categorize in the, in the image might be really hard to see. This data, this challenging data is one of the reasons that sort of generic computer vision methods don't really work right off the shelf. But I have some good news. Turns out, 
state-of-the-art computer vision models are actually pretty good at finding animals in new camera locations. So this means like, say you have camera trap data and you want to sort the blank images of which there are many, I know, you can use this open source detection algorithm called the mega detector, and it will be able to find animals in your images. Now, this is an important point. It's not categorizing the species. It's just finding the class animal. Um, and also we've at recently added two more classes, vehicle and human, to help sort of disambiguate between those types of classes and, and animals. One of the reasons this works is because by making it learn the class animal, which is more generic, instead of specific species classes, it's basically able to share information across the species. And that's one of the reasons that it actually is able to detect animals even on species that weren't in the training data. And this is really important because when you're trying to get a model to work anywhere in the world, that means you need training data from everywhere in the world, and that's really hard to scale. So this is a really nice first step. Um, and we, we discovered that these state-of-the-art um, detectors worked well in this generic class in a paper a couple of years ago. And I went and we built the first version of this detector um, when I was interning at Microsoft AI for Earth. And they've really taken that detector and run with it. And now there's a lot of really accessible tools that make this really easy for practitioners to use. And this cool GIF actually was posted on Twitter like yesterday um, by Aaron Greenville. And so this is data that is from you know, different parts of the world, definitely data that the model was never trained on. And I think that's really exciting. If you want to get started with this detection model and try it out on your data and try to filter out your blanks, um, you can go to the GitHub repository for Microsoft slash camera traps. Now, from there, it's kind of a choose your own adventure. It'll depend on, you know, what's your level of comfortability with Python or with things like TensorFlow. Um, but there's actually recently been some really exciting developments. For example, um, you can now actually run the mega detector within Camelot, which is an open source uh, camera trap data management tool. And that was announced last week. And so with that, it's kind of more like a turn the crank thing. Um, you, you go through Camelot and Camelot is actually directly sending the data to get, detect, to get detection labels from mega detector. Um, we also have integration with time lapse, which makes it really easy to go through the detection labels that are pulled from that model after the fact and correct them and change them and analyze basically how well it's doing. Um, but if you just want to get started, there's a lot of code on the Microsoft Camera Traps repository that will let you just test it on a little bit of data to start out with. If you try it and it doesn't work, don't worry. Please reach out to the team at Microsoft AI for Earth because they're trying to make this better actively all the time. And so we just recently released a fourth version of the mega detector, and that was one that added some of these you know, people and vehicle classes, but also added a lot more training data from different parts of the world and different types of cameras. And so this is really sort of a constantly expanding, constantly improving tool. Um, but we really want to make sure that uh, we can actually categorize species, right? Because that's the end goal. So finding animals is fine, but then you know a human still has to go through all those animal detections and label them with species. Now this is where we kind of get to a sticky point because it turns out that our state-of-the-art classification models really struggle to identify species in new camera locations. So if you train a computer vision model on a set of say, you know, 200 camera traps, it will actually do reasonably well on those 200 camera traps in the future. But you put out one new camera trap, even if it's in the same area of the world, the same set of species, that performance really decreases. And so you can kind of see it here in this plot. And this is from um, this recognition in Terra Incognito paper we published a few years ago where we explicitly trained on one set of locations and tested on new locations. And what you see is the error sort of across the board, regardless of how many training examples per species you have, increases when you go to, from these cis or locations seen during training to trans locations that weren't seen during training. And here's kind of an intuition for why that's true. So if you look at these images on the right, you can see that the first two images are taken from the same camera trap but they were taken a month apart. And this is really getting at the fact that because the cameras are static, the images can actually be really repetitive and really biased. They're very, very specific to that individual camera trap. And it actually turns out 
that the models start to memorize what a single trap will look like. And these models have millions of parameters, so it's pretty easy for them to memorize that small set of camera locations. And so you can imagine if you trained on one of those images and then tested the model on the other image, you would do pretty well. They're pretty similar. But then you see in these other two images examples from camera traps that are different from that one. You can see that what that you know, species of deer looks like in those camera traps can be quite different. And this generalization problem is basically one of the big things that as a computer vision community, we're trying to tackle, we're trying to improve so that these will actually work in practice on new cameras when we put them out. And this is another sticking point. Rare classes are hard. So you can see here, regardless of whether you're on, you know, training on locations you've seen before or ones you haven't, when you get down to like less than 100 training examples for a species, you just start to do a pretty bad job. And this is also a problem. It's something that will slowly get better as we expand the amount of data that we're training on and we increase the number of images we have for each class. But there's always going to be rare species, and frequently those rare species are ones that we care the most about because they're endangered or protected. And so this is something that we also need to tackle as a computer vision and machine learning community. It's basically how do we learn to be more efficient with less data so that we can actually do a good job on some of these rare classes. So there's kind of like three big challenges, I suppose, to making this really work in practice. First is there's tons of empty images that humans are having to sort through. The second is these images from static cameras are really repetitive and biased. And so we need to find a way to learn to overcome those repetitive, that repetitive bias nature of the images and actually be able to take those models and do well on new camera deployments without having to label additional data for every new camera we put out. And then the third problem is that rare species are rare. So we just don't have that many images from some species. So the tons of empty images, I'm going to say we're pretty close to solving that problem. Um, you know, there's still room to grow, obviously, and nothing is perfect. But I think things like the mega detector are a really nice step in that direction. And there's been other examples of really cool open source software packages that will do um, classification for blank, non-blank. Um, and those are also shown to generalize quite well. So I think we're pretty good at sorting out blanks. I kind of prefer a detection approach to a classification approach because with detection, it's quite easy to interpret. So if you get a model and you, you run an image through it and you get a result where it's like, this image has an animal in it and there's a box and you can look in the box and there's no animal, it's pretty obvious like where it made the mistake. You can be like, oh, it saw that branch. It thought that branch was an animal. We can try to improve from there. But if it just says, this image has an animal and there's no additional information, then it can be a lot harder to understand why the model made a mistake. Um, there are some tools you can use, but it's definitely it definitely takes more um, more data into the model. Um, so great, empty images, kind of check. Okay, so how do we actually classify species? So a first um, tack you can take is we found that it's actually you generalize much better if instead of training a classifier on the whole image, which is like all of this background information that's really repetitive over and over and over again. You instead use the mega detector to pull out crops tightly around the animals, and then you train a classifier on those crops. And the way you do that is you just take whatever class level labels you have for the image, and you give that label to each of the boxes. And then you can train a project specific classifier just on the boxes. And that does better both on locations you've trained on and locations you haven't. So this is a nice first step. It's a way to use the mega detector as a tool to give you kind of weak bounding box labels and be able to train up something that will work better than an image level classifier. Um, and then another point is basically there are sequences of images. A motion trigger fires and then you get this burst of images. Handling these sequences correctly is also really important. Um, essentially what will happen is frequently you'll have maybe three images and in one of them possibly the animal is quite easy to identify and in the other two it might be a lot harder. The animal might be blurry or be moving out of the frame. And so if we find good ways to aggregate information across these sequences, we get big boosts in performance. So for example, um, this year's top 10 teams in the iWildCam competition, all 10 of them 
use an approach like this, where they use the mega detector and they either retrain a detection model with those box plus class labels, or they actually change a classification model on those crops. So detection seems to really, and this is what we found as well in our research, detection is really a nice first step. But also, um, also these sequences are really important. And when I was talking to the teams who, who won the IOL CAM competition, some of them were seeing eight to 10% improvements in accuracy from taking different tasks to aggregating information across the sequences. So some naive approaches for how you aggregate that information is you can you know, take whatever labels you get across the burst and average them. You could use the median, um, or you could also use the mega detector to find which frames are empty or not empty, and then aggregate the information just across the non-empty frames. So only things that should have animals. Um, but uh, what can we do that's better than this? So um, just actually last week, um, we had a paper come out that is an algorithmic approach to trying to aggregate information across time and not just across a small burst of sequences, but actually across really long time horizons, trying to take advantage of this repetitive nature of the data to actually improve detection using up to a month of information at a time instead of just a small burst. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this. The paper is available online and I'm super happy to answer questions, but it's a bit complicated. Um, the important thing is that essentially we're able to um, when we're doing detection, aggregate information from over an entire month, find sort of these similar habitual um, things like this warthog going back and forth on a game trail, and pull information from all of that to be able to make a better categorization. And I think that this is really kind of the right idea for how to handle generalizing well to new camera locations without actually needing any additional labeled data. Um, we find that this approach really helps us improve performance in some of those challenging cases. Um, and so here we actually, we also tried it on a traffic camera data set. It should work for any static camera. But we're able to, you know, find some of these objects that are hidden behind trees or poorly lit or leaving the frame. And um, I'm really excited about the results. Uh, and if you want to try out this model, we have a um, model that was trained on Snapshot Serengeti using the location split, so trained on some locations and being tested on other locations from um, the, that was recommended on Lila.science. And if you have any data from Snapshot Serengeti or from East Africa, um, you can point the collab data, this collab demo to that data, and you can actually just sort of play around and give it more images or less and see how that context information is actually helping um, improve the categorization. Um, and using this method, we see, I mean, this is a really big improvement in performance. Um, from rel the, the absolute improvement was, I think, 18% mean average precision, and mean average precision is sort of the most commonly used detection metric in computer vision, but it's a relative increase of 47.6%, which is pretty exciting. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited about sort of taking this method and extending it and adapting it and, and even trying it for other types of static sensors, things like acoustic data. Um, but you'll see, rare classes are still hard. So even though we're doing a better job overall, we're still consistently doing worse on the species that don't have a lot of training data. And this is kind of, unfortunately, just a well-known problem across the field of machine learning. Um, so I'm giving this like images from a static camera repetitive and biased, like sort of a, a transparent check mark. Like we're, we're moving in the right direction with that. There's some exciting new open source models that you can train on your data and you can try and do better than you were able to do with just you know, these single frame or these naive approaches to handling sequences. But rare species are still rare. There's been some recent work of mine and of many other people like trying to handle rare classes. Like how do you actually improve performance on rare classes? People have tried things like using uh, data from iNaturalist or data from Flickr to basically add additional augmented training data to your class set to try to help learn how to do well on rare classes. Um, we've also tried actually generating synthetic training data, so using a game engine. And we find that even that um, is useful, but none of these things have really solved the problem. 
Um, one thing we're kind of hopeful about is potentially extending this attention-based approach to um, segmentation, which is kind of like over here where you are actually drawing a boundary around the entire animal instead of just a detection box to try to really help disambiguate background from foreground even within that small box. Um, and I think that that will again help, but unfortunately we're still at this point where none of these solutions is really, like we're still not gonna get 99% accuracy on something that only has you know less than 10 training images. So I'm giving a transparent X mark to this rare species a rare problem because even though there have been some, there's been some progress and there's some exciting sort of hacky database techniques to handle this, it's really still an issue. Um, and so then let's just dive into best practices. So here's a few things that we've seen sort of over and over again across the years that, um, that make it just really hard for people to kind of get started and get machine learning models that are working for them for their actual, um, for what they want them to do. So the first thing is, yeah, just what do you want your camera trap machine learning model to do? Do you want it to work very well on a set of, a static set of camera traps that's a network that's going to stay in the field for 10 years and you're going to keep using that same network of camera traps in the same positions? Now, if that's what you want to do, then the way you should evaluate your model is you should train on maybe the first month or the first year of data and test on some future data. So if you already have, let's say, two years of data, train on the first year, test on the second year, because that's going to give you an idea of how well these models will generalize to future years in the same positions. Um, if you are have a set of camera traps that you move every month, then you probably need to actually train on one set of locations and test on a held out set of locations. It's really important that we think about our evaluation in terms of what we want the model to do so that we don't get a false sense of confidence or think that we've got, you know, 99% accuracy on something when in fact it's actually maybe not as trustworthy as we'd like. This is another important point. People like to use a measure of accuracy, which is basically just how many of the categorizations did I predict that I got correctly? Um, that's all fine and good, but because the distribution of species can be really imbalanced, so common species show up a lot, rare species don't show up very much at all, if you weight every image the same, what you end up doing is basically just evaluating how well you're doing on common species. So I'd really like to push, you know, if you do care about performance on rare species, you should probably be either evaluating each species separately, or you should be doing an evaluation where you look at accuracy for every species separately and then average across the species so that every species is getting weighted the same. Again, it's just think about what you want your model to do and be careful with how you're evaluating it. Um, the next thing is don't start from scratch. So, you know, machine learning can be a little overwhelming, but there's also a lot of tools out there like, you know, plug in your data with labels and train up a classifier on just your set of data and see what happens. I'm recommending like there are also some really great tools like the mega detector that are out there that are trained on much more data than you can probably easily handle or easily train on yourself. Just take advantage of the models and of the work that the computer vision community is doing and, and try to use that in your pipelines um, so that you're just not starting from scratch. So you're not uh, limiting yourself in terms of what you can do with the data that you have. Um, and then the third thing is, <laughs> I cannot say this enough, don't blindly trust any model on rare species because we know that machine learning models struggle with rare species. And this kind of gets into this concept of like, quality control. So basically, you've trained your model, you've evaluated it on you know, some held out set, and you're reasonably confident it's working well. Now you're going to run it on you know, tons of unlabeled data that you have in your backlog. You should be doing at least random quality control across the predictions to make sure that it's actually doing what you expect it to do. And to also make sure that you're not getting something like um, model drift, where maybe the model worked really well the first year, but three years down the line, it actually started to perform a lot worse. And so you might need to add some more training data from recent years into your training set. 
Okay, so <laughs> that was probably a lot of information. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank all of the many amazing collaborators I've had um, doing all the work that I've done over the last actually eight years, um, turning machine learning models for camera traps. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love now to just take questions and have a discussion with you guys and, and try to help you sort of figure out where to get started. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. That was, um, that was fascinating. Um, so like we said at the start, <laughs> we did think we'd hit right up against the half hour. It's um it's a tight time frame. So if you can stay around, um, please do. Otherwise, we'll record all of the questions and um and the discussion, and it'll go up later. Um, but in the doc, um, uh, the the link that um Ellie shared earlier, we have a list of questions. I think this is working quite well. Um, oh, so for the for the discussion throw your videos on, um, make sure you turn your mic on and I'll call on you. Yep, yeah, Ellie's just posted that link again. Um, if you've got questions that have come up and you haven't dropped them into the chat, put them into the, the list and I'll, I'll run through people. Um, so the first person is uh, Gabby. You were the first person to ask a question. Do you have a mic? I don't know if you've, I, you didn't reply to my response, my question. Gabby? Okay, uh, so Gabby's question was, have you thought about, or, oh, you can talk, oh, you, Gabby, are you able to join us? I know you're in the chat. Hi, do you hear me? We yeah. can, yes. Hi. Hi, sorry, I, I thought it, it would be easier to allow video on mic, but I don't know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, first, uh, Thanks for the opportunity. Great talk. I, I love what you are doing. I'm a super newbie in this stuff. And I wanted to ask if you or anyone has been working on the interface between Mega Detector and Digicam, because it's, um, it's a software that's, uh, that I use a lot for tagging images, spe species mm. tag. And it would be awesome to, to be able to filter the images that have no animals from the ones that have animals. That for me, I, I don't mind classifying species, but if I can just have all the images that have animals to tag, that would be awesome. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so I, like I said, I'm not an ecologist, so I don't even necessarily know all the different tools that people use. Um, I don't think anyone's worked on the integration with that tool, mostly just because it's not a tool I've heard of before. But if you are interested in at least sort of bringing that to people's attention, or you wanted to reach out to the people who are who host that tool and see if they want to work with the the Microsoft team to see about integrating it within that tool, um, these are totally possible. Um, so yeah, I, I would reach out to um, on the Microsoft GitHub page. There's sort of a collaborators.md like a documentation file. Like if you want to collaborate with the Mega Detector. Um, and there, there's information on there, like how to get in contact with the team. And I think that that sounds like a great thing to bring up with them and, and maybe just start that conversation. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Thank you. I will do that because I think it will be very, very useful. Thank you. Hey, Anton, do you want to jump? Are you do you want to jump in? Because your question's related to this. Can, can you hear me? Yep, you can. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think that the, the question is the same. It's, it's like now uh, there are some software that have a preliminary integration of the uh, Microsoft uh, API for Camera Tab. And it's, it's, my problem is like uh, I need to decide only one. Time lapse, Camelot, Chopper, because I need to say in a project, okay, we want to, to try with that. And also for the for the last question, I think that Camelot have a little integrated integration with Digicam. And also the, the 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 good thing that Digicam have is like uh, allow you to to use them easily in, in R with CamTab R and Camelot have that integration. So I think that could be a good solution to to use Camelot in instead of Digicam. But only just my my opinion. Um, yeah, so one thing I will say is, I, I mean, I think the integration is slightly different. So with Camelot, it's actually almost like a turn the crank integration where you, if you already have your data in the Camelot system, you can request that it gets run through the mega detector and you don't even have to like 
do almost anything. And the Microsoft team doesn't really have to do anything. That integration is, is pretty seamless. Um, with time lapse, I don't think there's actually already the tool to kind of move data from time lapse, run it through the mega detector, bring it back, and then look at it in time lapse. It's more that you can get results from the mega detector, and the format the results are in is integrated within time lapse. So you can actually, if you're already used to a time lapse workflow, you can, you know, separately get those results, plug them in, and then you can like edit them within time lapse or you know make any changes, and that's pretty useful. But yeah, I mean, if Camelot is integrated already with this other tool, then that seems like probably all you really need to do is build the visualization to be able to visualize the boxes on the images within that tool. Okay. Okay. And um, really, thanks hey. for the work. I am I am really happy with the work that you are, the team, the Microsoft team are are, are doing. <laughs> Diego, do you want to jump in? Uh, hi, can you hear me? We can, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. First, if you're also using Wildlife Insights to use, I mean, the the camera trap data from Wildlife Insights to train the model. And my other question is that, sorry, <laughs> my other question is that I, I I work with camera trapping in the canopy, so the environment is very different. There's no like floor, so there's only a, some branches, and the branches are in different positions. So I, I don't know if you think it's possible to train a model to find animals in an environment like that as well? Um, yeah, so I guess there's two questions. So the first one is, is the mega detector trained on the wildlife insights data? The answer is slightly complicated. Um, Microsoft AI for Earth's team and the wildlife insights team are two separate things, um, but they have a lot of the same data collaborators. So the answer is mostly yes. Um, <laughs> So a lot, but you know, Microsoft and Google, who's working on the Wildlife Insights platform, have different data agreements with each of those collaborators. And I've gotten sort of a much more detailed picture of how complicated data politics can be than I'd ever want <laughs> by working with those two teams. Um, but yeah, the, the mega detector is trained on most of the data from Wildlife Insights. Um, and the second question was about whether I think it's possible to detect animals in the canopy. And I think absolutely. Um, there's really not any huge difference in terms of like what you're asking the model to do. It's just changing the statistical like structure of what the scene looks like. Um, highly occluded scenes can be a little more challenging for um, machine learning systems in general. So it might not work, you know, as well. But I imagine also for humans, it can be a little harder to find um, the objects in, in these really highly occluded um, canopy scenes. Usually a good rule of thumb is if it's hard for a human, it might be hard for a machine learning model too. Um, but yeah, I think really if, it, if the mega detector doesn't already work well in the canopy, then I think it's really only a matter of, um, you know, we can work with you, uh, we can pull in your data, we can get bounding box labels from the data and we can add it to training and then it should work better for canopy scenes for you and for anyone else who's using canopy camera traps. That's kind of the beauty of it is you just sort of it's this constantly growing and expanding model that um, is getting better and better sort of around the world in different different areas. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks for the talk as well. Yeah. Carly, do you want to jump in? I'm not sure Sarah's going to be able to answer this one, but um, yeah, do you want to jump in? Oh, yes. I love just bringing a challenge. Um, hi, thank you so much. And I was like literally just chatting with Sarah on Twitter like yesterday. Um, <laughs> I, I was just wondering uh, if what if you know of the status of things like 360 degree camera traps or like any like moving camera traps that's that pan or anything like that. Um, if you if you know of anything that's going on with that and how that might get integrated um obviously that might help a little bit with the repetitive biased kind of stuff so maybe and maybe no actually in terms of the repetitive bias stuff i actually think no um unfortunately just even if it's 360 degrees you still have like for any given camera location you're going to have a biased distribution across the species set and the perspectives that you see the species in at that camera are going to be biased as well 
And so even if you get a 360 degree view, it's still only in this one static point. So yeah, you're getting 360 degrees, but you're not getting a global picture of everything that might something might look like. So you're still gonna have the bias problems. That's, that's actually, I think, just going to be innately true of any static sensors ever. Um, I think with the 360 cameras or with, you know, like cameras that are panning, um, there's just like a few sort of additional um, like infrastructural challenges just to like setting up, you know, the models to ingest these different types of data, things like video. Um, I think the panning cameras, actually the mega detector, if you just do like frame by frame, would probably also work quite well just because like every single one of those frames is sort of similar to just a static picture of a camera. Um, but with the 360, um, the statistics are a bit different. Everything's warped. Uh, so I think one of the big challenges to getting detection to work well in 360 degree cameras is just that data scale that you need for machine learning to work well. Like basically you just need to be able to have lots of examples of 360 degree cameras, get labels for those and train up the model. And so I think it's not that it's not possible. It's just that actually it's more of a data bottleneck right now to making that happen. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the devices are still, I mean, the hardware is not really even there. Yeah. But I think, you know, eventually, I think we'll probably have systems that work well for all this stuff. And I really think the more that we are sharing data using stuff like Lila.science or, you know, once Wildlife Insights kind of comes online and, and gets sort of more accessible for the broad community, I think that's going to be a really amazing way to kind of get broader access and train broader models. Um, but yeah, I think really just scaling up the data is, is one of the best ways to handle it. And the more camera traps, the more of these static sensors we have in our system, sort of the less of a problem those biases are because you start to be able to average out over the biases over all the system, which is what a naturalist gets to do because every, pretty much every image of a naturalist is taken by a different human in a different place. So every single one of those images is sort of like its own, like its own sample. Whereas what happens with the camera traps is it's like, maybe for every static camera trap, you get like effectively 10 samples as opposed to like, you know, 10,000 images. Like those images are so repetitive that a lot of them kind of just collapse down into really like the usefulness of one image. All right, it's like pseudo, -rep pseudo replication. Yeah. Oh, Stephanie, you're muted. <laughs> Look, it was such a smooth transition. Um, <laughs> uh, let me try again. Um, Tom, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I went onto the GitHub page for the repo for Mega Detector, but it, I've come across this kind of thing before where you go and you think, oh, this is a great tool it exists for me to use. But sometimes there are kind of boundaries in a way, like some people might not know how to do Python or something like that. Have you guys considered using some kind of executable that someone could download in order to kind of install all the necessary files to use Mega Detector? Because if I'm like a hobbyist or a hobbyist comes along and they go, I have no idea how to install this, you're kind of like facing a barrier for more people helping to develop Mega, Mega Detector as well. So have you thought about maybe making it a bit easier for non-techie people to use? Yeah, um, and I think that they're, you know, the team is actively trying to find the, what the best ways to interact with people at the different levels of expertise are. Um, so I think right now they have it set up where like they have sort of a, a mega detector like Anaconda environment. But if you're not familiar with Anaconda, then maybe there's still yeah. barriers there. <laughs> Possibly we could like try using something like a Docker file, but then you have to know how to use Docker. So, yeah, exactly. So this is the thing yeah, I'm on about. Um, I think one of the sort of bigger sticking points with this idea of like pulling something that you're going to load to your local computer and um, and run there is that these models are big and running yep. them takes time. And if you have you know like a reason like a normal computer without like a high powered machine learning GPU running it over, you know, even thousands of images is going to take a long time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So they're really not, these models really aren't designed to be run um, like on a laptop, for example. Um, 
And so I completely agree that it would be really nice to have an easy way to just play with the model um, and, you know, like maybe just try it out on a few images. Um, and so uh, for a while we were, they were working with the TensorFlow Hub team and there was a, a version on TensorFlow Hub where you can just upload images and get results. Um, right. But then it's just this thing where it's like, okay, Google and Microsoft and, and like it just is hard to communicate yeah. between two large tech companies. And so yeah. I think that that model ended up being quite deprecated and annoying. Um, I think you're totally right. But I also think like I would love for there to be a way for someone to just upload an image and try it. I've been thinking that maybe we should just make like a Jupyter notebook style tutorial where yeah, I mean, I've used code, like on like a, you know, like not on your local machine, but it's actually connecting. Maybe something like using yeah. code where it's connecting yeah, exactly. to the remote oh, um, okay. server. Yeah, like uh, Colab's really good. I've used it before for different uh, machine learning stuff. And yeah, it's really easy and, to do. There's loads of tutorials out there for it. Even like somebody who's not familiar with coding can just jump on, go yeah. through it, kind of click all the play buttons and stuff, and it's quite easy to use. Um, so that would be like a big help, I think. Yeah. Um, so I have we have a collab. I released a collab tutorial for that um, context model uh, that we built. And so for that one, at least, um, you know, I, the model that we're linking to in there is is only trained on Snapchat Serengeti, and it's specifically showing like how this context can can help. But um, after building that, it would be pretty easy to actually just copy that format and just show results from uh, the mega detector instead of that one. So maybe um, I know Chris Ye is on the call, who's uh, joining my lab at Caltech, but also interning with AI for Earth this summer. Um, and so maybe me and Chris can talk about uh, just making like a quick little collab demo to go in the mega return. Yeah, I mean, if you did it, it just help more people get on board with it and then you can collect more data. So it's just helping things like connect a bit more as well. Totally, yeah. Can, can I jump in and ask a question that like kept coming up during registration? And, and I, I guess it's a question from the conservation side of things. Like, uh, is it, should we be learning how to do this ourselves or should we be outsourcing it? Is it going to, and, and at what point, is it worth learning now or are things like Wildlife Insights going to make actually learning the, the behind the scenes stuff like um, redundant within a year or two or five or 10 years? I don't know, what, what sort of, that's so a here, Here's my plug for learning to be a good technologist in conservation. Um, <laughs> Maybe wildlife insights when it, you know when it's like you know really robust and being publicly used will be really great at I don't know for example like detecting species in camera trap images across the board because wildlife insights is trying to make a model that's like global scale which means that there's always going to be trade offs right yeah um, you know the model will be trained on more data than anything so it's probably going to be quite accurate. But also, what if you are a user who only cares about one like very rare species of lemur? Um, possibly the right way for you to interact with your data and machine learning won't be this general global model. Or what if, for example, one day you actually want to be categorizing behavior of your target species, or you want to try to use machine learning to you know, look at like ratios of like young to parents or you know there's, there's all these questions that can be answered with machine learning that i think actually are very feasible but like it's pretty hard to get computer vision scientists and i actually fight all the time um to kind of get get people to work on these types of problems um and i really think one of the right solutions is like we should be training our young ecologists to be proficient in technology and to be able to you know, maybe they're not going to be tinkering with the architectures, but they should feel comfortable um, collecting labels for data and spinning up a quick classifier. Like that's actually, there's a lot of tutorials online, like just that kind of confidence that you can have with machine learning, I think is really worth the effort because it's going to really expand, you know, for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, what you can do with your data. Okay. Just going to uh, pipe in and say thanks. Thanks for answering the question. Yeah. Um, next up, we have uh, Nicholas. Oh, you're in a noisy environment. Do you want me to just read yours out? Mm, 
Uh, and I know it's a little bit too noisy now, so I can even try to call. Yeah. Ooh, it is joyful though. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, wonderful. Um, so uh, you had an issue with um, it being, just tell me if I've got this wrong. So you had a comment um, when Sarah was demonstrating and it popped out an antelope and you had, you're basically a question, um, you had an issue with the fact that the species wasn't an antelope. That's a very broad <laughs> definition. Yeah. Um, but so you said that. Remember, tagging of rare species. We have like 100 uh, mammals in the area, and yeah, roughly 40 of them. We don't even have photos of them. How do we? How can we uni uniquely identify the species in th this context? What's the best approach? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, what we found. Sorry. No, no cut out. Um, so what we found was that um, in your demo you showed the gravest zebra, and that's a rare species compared to the common zebra. Then you have a number of unique specifications of the species, and how do you align that to the training model when you almost have no photos of a rare species? Um, so this is that, like I was talking about at the end, this is an open question. This yeah. is the thing that machine learning still has not solved across all of machine learning, which is like, mm -hmm. how do you get a model to work well on stuff that's rare, stuff that you don't have a lot of examples for? Um, right now, I'd say your best bets. Um, there's there are a few things that you can do that we know help. They don't they don't solve the problem. Um, but one thing you can do is. You can scrape data from iNaturalist for that species and use that as additional training data for your model. You can scrape data from Flickr and use that for additional training data from your model. The problem is iNaturalist and Flickr are not really the same domain as a camera trap. So there's kind of this domain shift and so that that data is not actually as useful as a camera trap image of that species, but it helps a bit. Um, another thing you can do, and this is like hacky as all heck, but we found it actually boosted performance quite a lot, is say you have like five images for a species, not zero, because zero is really hard, but say you have like five. You go in and manually crop out the animal, and then you take that cropped animal and you create training data by pasting your cropped animal on all of these empty images that you have. So you take all the images that the mega detector found to be empty, and you paste it just randomly, flip it around and paste it, and change like some of like stretch it out, whatever. And we call this data augmentation. Um, I think some people have called it like different weird things like splatting, for example. But um, that kind of tactic, it feels really hacky, but it actually will help your model understand how to disambiguate between like the actual animal, the thing it should care about and the background. So that's what I recommend people do now first. Um, yeah, it's an open problem, and it's not something that uh, that machine learning has been able to solve yet. Um, okay, David, I think your question was next. Did you want to throw in your one, uh, David Savage, around um, yeah. crypto species? So, uh, yeah, so I'm wondering um, if you have a species that is very sneaky and in a very noisy environment. So the, the project that I was working on like five years ago was snakes in a background full of sticks. Um, <laughs> so, so like five years ago, this was something that we had a lot of trouble with. We kind of ended up figuring out something. And I'm just sort of wondering kind of how performance has progressed in those kinds of use cases from sort of then to now. Yeah, I mean, like I said before, stuff that's hard for humans is going to be harder for for machines. Um, so, like, machines are really great at finding big deer in open fields, right? So are humans. Um, <laughs> snakes surrounded by sticks, I can totally see how that would be quite tricky. But um, I think really with stuff like that, it's at this point, um, the models and like our compute capacity has scaled up to the point where like you can learn to do a really good job with something that's that difficult. Um, but what you might need is a lot of data mm -hmm. of that difficult thing um, to be able to get the model to train properly. So I, from my perspective, that seems possible. I mean, 
I've seen some amazing computer vision results, um, especially in the healthcare industry where they're finding like really tiny, like cancerous blips. Um, like it, it's very possible. You just need a lot of training data, which can be hard. I know, yeah. especially, yeah. you know, yeah. if your collection um, criteria, like the way that you're setting up your, um, your sort of like data design or whatever is like you pointing the camera like down towards something and maybe like other people don't use that same data collection procedure. So there's statistical differences. So you can't use data from other projects. That's where it gets tricky. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So Tim's questions next, but he doesn't have a microphone. So he asked, are there any advances in using AI to identify animals in videos from camera traps? Yeah. There were a couple of questions around videos. What's, uh, what's the deal there? Yeah, um, so you can treat a video as sets of frames. So first thing you can do is you can just you know, take your video, separate it into image, image frames, and run something like the mega detector or a classifier over those image frames. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a lot of work in the computer vision space that are basically like different methods for um, aggregating information from multiple frames at once. Some of them use what are called 3D convolutions. So instead of just taking in a 2D image and running a neural network over that, it takes in a stack of 2D images. Now it's this like three dimensional stack that's representing the video and it runs over that. Um, and actually the context RCNN method that we just came out with that's using attention across frames, it doesn't care what the temporal difference is. So what you can do is you can send in your video as the sort of context group and extract you know context from all those images and then run detection over all those images and that will aggregate the temporal information in like a really adaptive easy way so you could you can run that model as well um, there's a group um, so the driven data um, sort of team uh, they've released this platform called Zomba and they're specifically handling camera trap video and right now, all of their um, models and, and everything they're doing is, is specifically centered around chimps. So it's somewhat limited, but um, we actually just met earlier this week and talked about, you know, how do we come up with like an efficient way to use mega detector plus their video processing software and kind of like come up with a good way to like detect animals in video and, and potentially even return, you know, this one's empty, this one's empty. This video has animals from like second five to 10, you know, just to help streamline the process for humans a little bit. So work in progress. Okay. Katie, are you still on? Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Hey, Sarah. Um, thanks so much, Stephanie. I had a question about labeling. Um, do you know of any softwares that facilitate labeling? Um, there yeah, are... Whether it's like exporting as a CSV or whatever. Yeah. There are so many tools out there for labeling. Um, but actually the AI for Earth team, um, Benjamin Kellenberger uh, just released a whole platform like specifically to handle labeling um, within like the AI for Earth uh, system. And so I would start there, um, mostly just because that stuff is gonna plug and play pretty well with some of the existing um, Microsoft AI for Earth tools. Um, I will get a link to it and um, give it to Stephanie so that she can maybe post it in, um, somewhere, but I, I, would, I would start there. But there's tons of stuff. If you just Google like drawing bounding box labels on images, like the, you know, people are developed these tools or, you know, drawing, you know, segmentations or giving classification labels. There's, there's lots of tools already out there. There's cool video labeling tools. So I would, yeah, take advantage of something that already exists instead of making a new one. Cool, thank you. What was the, just quickly, what was the name of the one, the chimp one? Oh, um, it's called Zomba. I'll, I'll put a link to that too. Um, but it's the Driven Data. Is um, they, they host some competitions. They hosted a, a Snapshot Serengeti competition um, last year. Uh, and yeah, and then they, they had a chimp competition and then they sort of released the model from the chimp competition and they built this Zomba tool to handle videos to make it easier to use. Okay, we've got two more questions. Um, one's from Scott. Uh, is there generally a maximum distance from the camera where machine learning can detect um, animals? Yeah, um, so actually I think this is like, so smaller things are harder to detect just across the board uh, for humans and for machines, sort of like a broken record at this point. But um, so that means small animals like rats 
can be harder for machine learning to detect even if they're close to the camera. And then small animals far away from the camera, like big animals far away from the camera that look small can be harder to detect. Um, in terms of like how far in a distance of like in a distance sense, um, unfortunately, I think that's really going to depend on where the camera is, what species you're trying to detect. There's a lot of things that would make it really hard to just give like a blanket estimate of distance. So he gave some more context. He's, mo he's mostly working on large mammals in open landscape in the Arctic. So oh. they can see animals from like a thousand meters away um, when manually classifying. Uh, but he's noticed when using um, mega detector, it seems to work very well for animals around 100 meters, under 100 meters from the camera. Yeah, so actually this is one of the reasons that we developed that context model was specifically because, um, so those detections might fire quite far away, um, but then their confidence is really low. And so then they don't get spit out of mega detector. But when, when we use that model that sort of builds this representation of context for a camera and then goes and does the detection, what you find is it's actually able to learn what is or isn't background. So if you've got this long horizon and normally there's nothing there and then there's a little blip there, it'll be able to detect it much better because it has this temporal context. It, unlike the mega detector, which doesn't know anything about what else has been seen from frame to frame, it actually understands what that looked like in the previous frames that it can, it, it's basically like, um, it's like a more adaptive machine learning, machine learning E way to do background subtraction, which um, ends up being quite brittle with low frame rates. Okay. So well, I totally recommend trying that. I, I think I'm, I'm really happy with that model. It makes a lot of sense intuitively. It's totally how humans look at data, right? We, we don't just look at one image and try to guess what's there. It's like you look at all the other images that are seen. Um, he says, thank you uh, for the insight, much appreciated. Um, Rob, do you want to drop, jump, drop in? Uh, jump in, sorry. Hi, Sarah, thank you for a great talk. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, like, there's a, obviously a lot of people in this community who are conservationists who would be keen, I think, to help one another Mm -hmm. uh, progress this as much as possible. So what what would you recommend as a community that we could do to sort of help each other move something like Mega Detector forward? Yeah. Like what's um, the best thing we can do? Yeah, well, so I guess there's a few different aspects of that. So one aspect is like making the model better. And basically these models get better the more data they have access to. Um, and so one of the best things you can do if you actually want to improve the mega detector is run it over your data. And if it works well, great. But if it doesn't work, that's fantastic because that means that's the data we need to make it work better. Like, so if you try, just try it on your data and if it doesn't work, actually report that back to the team. Um, give example data for you know things that haven't worked so that we can add those into the training set and try to catch those types of mistakes in the future. So that's one thing. And that's just like improving that specific model. In terms of making machine learning more accessible, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that we're all kind of trying to find ways to integrate with these different tools that are already used by the ecology community. But I think that's still a pipeline that's, that's hard, right? Like understanding how to bridge this gap between people who are like super tech savvy and people and who know nothing about ecology and people who know everything about ecology and maybe don't have like the tech skills to, to dig into a model or train it up. And so, um, yeah, finding the right ways to just bridge connections across that space and also just give feedback, um, in sort of a like so if you spend the time to figure out how to integrate the mega detector with your data and you have like a good system maybe just like writing up documentation of like this is how i did it and it worked for me and, and sharing that within the community so that it's sort of like just facilitates like that startup um a little a little quicker if that makes sense rob did you have yeah. a second question yeah that's great sarah um i the other question was a bit more specific. Um, so I, I think a common problem is, you know, you, as you said, you have these rare 
animals that are difficult to label. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've not seen much discussion about is rather than having a model that specifically labels, say, a rare species, it could be pretty useful if instead of that it just says, I don't know what this is, kind of like what you said before about, you know, we know it's an animal mm -hmm. uh, because in a lot of cases, you know, you're talking about handfuls of images that people could probably look at quite quickly. Yeah. Um, is, it, is there a way to get the model to basically do something like that that says, I don't know what this is, it's probably not something I've seen before. Can you have a look at it sort of idea? Yeah. Maybe? So this is something that in machine learning, like I've heard it called like anomaly detection um, or like open set detection which is or, or classification, which is basically like you have a set of things that are well understood and then you have stuff that may or may not be those things and un, like trying to get a model to understand when it doesn't know. It makes total sense. It turns out it can actually be kind of tricky for machine learning models um, and kind of hard to understand why it's tricky for machine learning models. Um, so one problem is, so say you wanna say, um, okay, we have these common species and then we're gonna bin everything else into the, into the class unknown, throw them all together and make it guess unknown. So the problem with that is that it ends up just sort of not learning, like it, it, it learns to memorize all the specific things in your unknown bucket, but um, unlike sort of the general class animal, it's like understanding like that these things are different from the things that you know well, that can be really tricky. And especially in some of these like fine grained categorization challenges. So like differences between very visually similar species, if one's common and the other one is rare, most likely the machine learning model is gonna guess the common one, even if you have this unknown bucket because of just sort of like how these things are optimized. Like if it sees a lot of examples of this and a lot of examples, not just being like numbers of images, like a lot of variety of examples of this. And one example of that in unknown, it'll probably just learn to ignore this example because it'll think it's just noise. Um, so yeah, open problem. I completely agree in terms of the anomaly detection scenario and so one thing people do use is they'll use the like sort of score that comes out of the machine learning model and if you know nothing is scoring very highly they'll say okay this is probably something the model doesn't know so i should look at it in person that's a reasonable way to, place to start and i think that's great um but the problem is machine learning models are kind of notorious for being highly confident and wrong in some scenarios so they'll be, you know, they'll say like, I, I have this 99% confidence that this is a, you know, species X when actually it's species Y. And those types of mistakes are really hard to catch, right? Um, it's just really hard to, to know when you should or should not trust a machine learning model. And it's a black box, so it's tricky. Um, one thing that I've been doing lately, just in my own experiments, is um, basically just trying to figure out like some statistical metrics for when an image is hard. <laughs> so like if an image is really dark or super blurry, like, or, you know, doesn't have a lot of contrast, then I'm like, and these are things you can measure with just image statistics. Then I'm like, okay, that's like a vote that probably if the machine learning model is really confident and the image is really hard, that I should maybe take a look at it because it might be something weird going on. Um, but that's just like one hacky check and balance you can try to do to try and find these really confident, incorrect guesses. Um, but yeah, I think finding rare stuff or finding uncommon stuff in a systematic way would be amazing. And so I, a lot of people are sort of trying to figure out how to do that well. It actually comes up a lot also in individual re-identification because in that case, like your set of classes, which is your set of individuals is like constantly shifting and changing as more animals are born or die. Um, and so this is something that maybe they've spent a little bit more time investigating in the animal re-identification space than in the classification space. And I'm hoping maybe we can pull some inspiration from that. Okay. I know there are still questions coming in, but we are 40 minutes over and I feel like it's probably time for us to wrap up um, and say thank you to Sarah. Um, 
we've recorded all of the questions that are coming through. I've dropped a link into the thread on Wild Labs where it's a good place for you to drop them. Um, so we'll we'll move them over into Wild Lab. Yeah. Uh, I am also going to gonna share the uh, collaborative doc one more time. It has all of the resources you need to follow up. It's got a link to that thread. It's got a link to Twitter. It's everything you need all in one place. If you have follow up questions, you can find the right section in here. Wonderful. Thanks, Ellie. Um, uh, and we'll update. We'll go through the chat and update that document with with everything. I think we've been capturing it. Um, but thank you so much, Sarah. That was awesome. Um, don't forget, everyone. This is happening every week on every Thursday for the next eight weeks. It's a 10, 10 episode uh, season. Um, so next week we're going to be tackling machine learning still, um, but looking at acoustic data set. So um, do register for that one and we'll see you next week. Um, but thank you everyone. Uh, and thanks Sarah and thanks Ellie. Um, great job. Oh, thanks, thanks everybody.